Hi, and welcome to the lecture number seven of our Introduction to Photonics video series. Today's topic is going to be the light sources, and we are also going to describe the anatomy of the human eye. In general, light sources can uh, be defined as the sources that uh, produce or emit the light. We have uh, natural light sources, and we also have man-made light sources. Man-made light sources can be further uh, broken down into uh, non-laser light sources and laser light sources. This lecture is going to cover the subsection of uh, so-called non-laser light sources. This slide uh, presents the list of all uh, non-laser light sources that you may come across uh, in uh, the field of photonics. So we are going to discuss so-called incandescent sources, fluorescent or low pressure discharge lamps, high intensity and high pressure discharge lamps, flash lamps and arc lamps, and finally light emitting diodes or popular LEDs. Popular incandescent light sources are using tungsten as a material that uh, the filaments, filaments are made out of. So tungsten is uh, having a few uh, uh, properties that are very interesting from the perspective of an incandescent light source, uh, among which the most important are low vapor pressure, high melting point of uh, 3655 Kelvin, and finally the strength. Uh, it's also important to mention that most modern incandescent lamps, in addition to the tungsten filament, are also filled with a, a gas uh, with the purpose of uh, extending their lifetime, extending the lifetime of the filament, and that gas is usually a mixture of argon and uh, nitrogen, although we may also come uh, across the lamps uh, that are based of, on a halogen. Uh, so halogen is used in uh, small amounts uh, to basically uh, prevent the particles of tungsten uh, from a filament to be deposited on the glass. So during the process of, uh, of uh, operation of the incandescent lamp, uh, when the tungsten is being heated to high temperatures, there's going to be particles of tungsten that are going to be relieving the filament and deposited on the on either side of the, of the glass bulb. Uh, usually this is uh, being observed as a black coating on the inner surface of the light bulb. In order to prevent that, we are adding special types of materials, so-called halogens, such as bromine, chlorine, and iodine, that are going to prevent this type of buildup on the inner, inner, inner uh, surface of the glass of the, of the light bulb. It's also important to mention that halogen lamps are hot, and in general, uh, all incandescent light sources are hot. That there's multiple reasons why. Uh, they uh, are kept hot, uh, among which the most important is to uh, is, uh, is uh, need to uh, uh, keep the regenerating cycle going, uh, because nothing less than 500 degrees Fahrenheit will uh, will do this regeneration. Regeneration. It's also important to mention that ordinary glass doesn't stand the high temperature that's needed for this regenerating cycle. And uh, for that reason, all halogen lamps are made of special types of uh, heat resistance glass or quartz. That is basically the constit constitutive element of, uh, of uh, uh, the most popular and modern types of incandescent light sources. So this slide further uh, describes the uh, lamp filament. So the, as we already mentioned, lamp filaments are made out of tungsten wire. And uh, sometimes they are used in a straight length, but uh, very often they are formed into a coil in order to uh, increase the luminescence of a light bulb. So uh, longer the filament is, it is going to have a, a better ability to produce uh, brighter light. So that's the reason why very often the filaments are being coiled into a form into a coil. Uh, sometimes you, we also have closed spaced coils to secure the brighter and uniform light. And sometimes uh, we have a coil, a coil over the coil uh, to further increase the total length of the, of the filament. If you are interested in a cost affordable or less expensive types of uh, light bulbs, they would have a wide spaced filaments. And these uh, types of uh, filaments are very practical for many applications, such as light projectors that would not require uh, strong light. So uh, as uh, you can uh, uh, see from this slide, uh, filaments made out of tungsten are coming in different uh, shapes and forms uh, that could determine the luminescence or uh, ability of the light bulb to produce uh, a brighter or uh, less bright light. The next type of light source that we are going to mention are so-called fluorescent light sources. 
So these types of light sources are not going, using thermal effect. Uh, they are using, actually using chemical effect to produce the light. So we are talking about uh, low pressure discharge lamps uh, that uh, have a fluorescent phosphor coating on the inside of the glass. And uh, most of these fluorescent lights would consist of mer mercury discharge lamps that would emit 90% of their energy at a, uh, at a wavelength of uh, ultraviolet of uh, 253.7 nanometers. So what's basically uh, happening in these uh, fluorescent light uh, uh, sources or light bulbs is the ultraviolet photons that uh, are uh, present in a fluorescent bulbs would be exciting a number of phosphors that, uh, that would uh, start uh, producing the light and uh, that we are seeing as a, as, a, as a very bright white light in the case of, of uh, fluorescent bulbs. It's also important to mention that uh, an, uh, a constitutive element of fluorescent lamp lamps is also uh, the electrodes. We have a cathode, hot cathode on one side, and very often sometimes cathode can also be cold. And then on the other side, we have anode. It's important to mention that uh, there's different uh, principles uh, on which uh, the cold and the hot electrodes uh, are working. So very often cold electrodes would be uh, needing something called a rapid start, uh, while on the other side, hot cathode electrodes would give greater luminous, luminous uh, efficiency. And because of that, most lamps today uh, use uh, hot cathode electrodes. Uh, what we consider so-called luminous efficiency, that's a ratio of the visible light energy produced by a light source uh, to the electrical energy that is uh, used as an input energy for these types of, uh, of uh, light sources. So if we are talking about fluorescent light, we are talking about uh, about 40% efficiency of, of a lamp uh, that's uh, about 80 inches long. And uh, it turns out that the efficiency, the luminous efficiency of fluorescent lamp is going to increase with its length. Uh, so longer the, the, uh, the fluorescent lamp is, it's going to have better efficiency and it's going to produce brighter light. So on this slide, on the left-hand side, uh, we see a, a pictorial view of the whole process that is taking place in a fluorescent uh, light source. As we already mentioned, we have a phosphor uh, coating on the inside uh, of, the, of the glass, and we also have a mercury inside filled, uh, uh, that, that's filling the, the, the glass tube. So when um, the uh, uh, electricity, when the current is uh, uh, brought to the uh, two electrodes uh, on uh, each side, on each end of the fluorescent bulb, these electrons are going uh, to uh, to hit the, uh, the mercury, and uh, mercury is gonna uh, mercury atoms are going to produce uh, ultraviolet radiation. So these uh, ultraviolet photons are gonna be hitting the phosphorus coating on the inside uh, glass of the glass tube, and would be exciting phosphorus, and then phosphorus would start uh, producing bright light that we see on the outside of the uh, of the fluorescent light. It's also important to mention that the output of a fluorescent lamp is also a function of, uh, of the ballast that is being used. Uh, we already mentioned that we have a, a rapid start and also we can have a preheat uh, ballast. Most of today's lamps uh, operate with a rapid start balanced, uh, although the research has suggested that the preheat balance may yield up to 20% higher light output as compared to the, to the rapid start. A uh, life cycle of a fluorescent lamp is, can also be significantly affected by the choice of the ballast. So the ballast, uh, be it either rapid start or preheat, plays an important role in, a, in, a, in the performance or function of the fluorescent light source. The next type of light source that we are going to mention are so-called HIDs or high-intensity discharge lamps. Uh, here we are talking about a specific type of a, a gas discharge lamp that uh, is going to produce light by a means of an electric arc and uh, plasma formation. So electric arc is going to be uh, formed between the tungsten electrodes that are housed inside of the, of the glass bulb made out of uh, either fused quartz or uh, fused alumina. The tube is uh, filled with both gas and metal salts where gas facilitates the initial uh, strike of the arc. And once uh, we have an arc started, uh, what's gonna happen is that the temperature's gonna uh, rise and the metal salts inside of the glass tube are going to start evaporating and forming plasma 
and uh, uh, the plasma formation in turn is going to increase the intensity of light that's being produced by the arc uh, between the between the electrodes. As already mentioned, uh, fused quartz or fused aluminum uh, arc tubes are filled with um, different types of um, metal halides or mercury and sodium and they're under the pressure that's why they're called uh, uh, high intensity high pressure uh, discharge lamps so the pressure is about two to four atmospheres and uh, it's also important to mention that uh, very often uh, these uh, lamps are going to have two glass envelopes uh, the inner quartz discharge tube and an outer glass jacket the outer glass jacket uh, uh, has a main purpose of absorption of uh, uh, ultraviolet radiation that's being produced or generated by the internal operation of the bulb. In certain instances, the outer jacket can be broken through certain uh, external effect, and in such a case, if the uh, outer jacket is broken, uh, a substantial levels of the ultraviolet radiation are going to be emitted outside of the bulb, uh, which poses certain uh, risk for a skin burn and eye inflammation from uh, from uh, this radiation so uh, it's important for that to be uh, uh, addressed in certain way it turns out that the lamp that uh, uh, would uh, that these types of lamps would uh, automatically extinguish if the outer envelope is broken or punctured uh, so that uh, reduces the risk of uh, of a skin burn or eye inflammation due to this uh, uh, dangerous UV radiation that can be getting out of these bulbs if the outer jacket is broken. This slide presents uh, a few uh, pieces of information about flash lamps and arc lamps. Uh, here we are still talking about high intensity discharge devices that are commonly used in photography and laser technology. So we are talking about uh, slightly smaller types of uh, uh, light sources. They also contain certain types of uh, uh, gases and uh, their uh, uh, operation is also based on a flash or arc that's initiated by the high voltage uh, across the discharge tube. Uh, so what's going to happen inside is the ionization of the gas and production of the high intensity light uh, with output peaks in both the visible and infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, if uh, you are looking at the size of these uh, so-called quartz tubes, it's usually about 1.5 millimeter in thickness with a metal electrode at each end. Uh, there's also uh, certain uh, uh, cases where uh, water jackets are provided for cooling purposes of these types of lamps. And finally, we are going to mention our good friend uh, LED or light emitting a diode. Uh, here we are talking about a semiconductor device that uh, is emitting a light uh, based on a certain uh, uh, different effect uh, compared to the light sources that we already mentioned. Most of LED devices are made of aluminum gallium arsenide, and they are very common in fiber optic communications, pocket calculators, and other, other visual displays. Uh, we are very familiar with semi segment displays that are also used in electronics. So uh, these devices can emit light in both the visible and infrared regions of the spectrum uh, based on uh, the application. And there's, there are certain differences uh, between uh, laser diodes and LED diodes that we are going to elaborate more in, uh, in the classes that uh, follow. So in the case of uh, an LED or light emitting diode, light is emitted in all directions and it's based on so-called uh, spontaneous emission as opposed to the, to the uh, laser semiconductor laser diodes where uh, above a certain uh, threshold uh, so-called uh, st uh, stimulated emission is taking place. So uh, it's also important to uh, elaborate that the power uh, from uh, LEDs is generally in the microwatt range up to maybe a few milliwatts. So the power is not that, uh, not that high, but there's a whole bunch of other advantages, especially their size uh, and, their, uh, and their cost. So uh, again, LEDs are small in size. They are low temperature type of devices. They are rugged and they are relatively inexpensive. So not only that they're used in electronics today, we also have regular household types of uh, light bulbs that are made on an, uh, that are based on LED technology. They are slightly more expensive than uh, regular uh, traditional uh, incandescent bulbs, uh, but they are also much more efficient than uh, than traditional incandescent bulbs. So in order to fully understand the operation of uh, of an LED. You should have a little bit of a background uh, in uh, electronic devices, uh, specifically uh, the basics of, uh, of uh, uh, semiconductor-based PN junctions. So here we are talking about a semiconductor, most of the time silicon, 
uh, that's being doped with a N type uh, uh, of a material on one side and a P type of material on the other side. So one side of the uh, so-called N type of, uh, of silicon uh, has excess of uh, electrons, while the other side uh, has an excess of the holes or positive uh, charges. And then there's also the boundary or the barrier between the two that is uh, free of uh, any kind of uh, uh, electrons or holes and uh, pre presents the bar barrier uh, to, the f to the free flow of the current. This barrier can either shrink or expand uh, based on uh, how the diode is biased with an external source. So in the case of a forward bias, this uh, barrier between the P and N junction is going to shrink and is going to enable uh, the, uh, the, uh, the current carriers uh, to jump from one side to the other and establish the current. And in the case of the, uh, of the reverse bias, uh, this uh, uh, barrier is going to expand and it's going to further prevent any kind of uh, uh, current uh, uh, through this uh, barrier. In other four, uh, words, in such a case, in the case of reverse bias, the, the PN junction or uh, the diode is going to be blocking any kind of flow of the current. Uh, what is of interest for us when we are talking about light emitting diodes, which is, which is just a special type of a, of a diode, is that in the case of a forward bias, when the, the, uh, the barrier uh, between the P and N uh, type of a silicon is uh, uh, reduced to the minimum, uh, the, the current carriers are going to be moving from one side to the other. And it turns out that uh, as the current carriers are, or electrons are moving from one side to the other, they are going to be uh, moving from the higher energy state to a lower energy state. Uh, and uh, in order to uh, uh, meet the law of conservation of the energy, uh, uh, these electrons will be uh, releasing the energy in the form of uh, photons, uh, which is basically the light that we are observing on a macroscopic scale uh, in the case of, uh, of an LED. So that's that's uh, in a in a nutshell how uh, how a light emitting diode works. So uh, it's important to understand the the uh, the basic theory behind the operation of the regular diode that's based on a on a on a PN junction on a on a on a specific type of a semiconductor. The next subject that we are going to study is the anatomy of a human eye. Uh, this is an important subject from the perspective of the of the safety that uh, has to be uh, implemented in a in a photonics lab. It turns out that uh, certain light sources of a laser type uh, are uh, posing a certain hazard, a safety hazard to uh, sensitive uh, parts of our body, uh, especially to the human eye and also to the skin. So in order to uh, really understand uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole uh, background behind this laser safety uh, hazard, we have to understand the anatomy of the human eye. So uh, human eye represents a complex optical system that's designed to receive, focus, and detect light. Uh, we are talking about a human organ that is roughly of the shape of a slightly elongated sphere, about the size of a quarter, uh, of an inch of a diameter. The outer white layer of the eye, so-called sclera, uh, sclera has a certain internal fluids, uh, uh, specifically so-called vitreous humor and uh, aqueous humor that help to maintain the shape of the eye. The light is going to pass through the, uh, to the, to the front portion of the eye, that so-called cornea, uh, into the eye. And then uh, once uh, the light uh, enters the eye, it's going to be passing through the lens that's going to be focusing all the light onto the small spot in the back of the eye, which is so-called the retina. So uh, that's uh, exactly why uh, the uh, certain light sources are dangerous to the eye, because the huge amounts of light that are entering to the uh, front portion of the eye are going to be focused on a small spot. So uh, the irradiance that we, uh, the concept of the power over the area that we introduced in uh, one of the previous lectures uh, is going to increase significantly. So again, all the power that's uh, entering to the to the pupil to the to the front portion of the eye is going to be uh, focused on a small spot. So we are reducing the area, and in in turn, we are increasing the irradiance of the of that light uh, uh, that's uh, reaching the back of the eye. And that's uh, what poses this, the, the safety hazard. So when the light uh, reaches the back of the eye, it is going to hit the uh, optical nerve. And uh, those, uh, the cells of the optical nerve are going to relay 
that optical image in the form of electrical signals to the brain for interpretation. We already mentioned the irradiance, uh, which is a power over the area. It turns out that the light irradiance on the retina is a uh, hundred thousand times greater than the light irradiance at the front of the eye due to the uh, focusing ability of the lens that's a part of the eye. So here we're talking about considerable optical gain that can create uh, eye hazard when uh, uh, stray laser beams are uh, entering the eye. A little bit more information about, that, uh, at, about the anatomy of the human eye, specifically a little bit about the cornea and so-called aqueous humor. So we are talking, uh, when we're talking about the cornea, we're talking about the outermost transparent layer that covers front of the eye. Uh, the, uh, the, this part of the eye uh, can withstand dust, sand, and other assaults from the environment. Uh, and the reason for that is because the cells of the cornea have ability to, uh, to uh, uh, regenerate themselves or to replace themselves within uh, 40 48 hours. So uh, even mild injuries to the cornea are healed quickly. Uh, the aqueous humor is a liquid, mostly water, between the cornea and the lens. This water in the aqueous humor absorbs the heat and protects the internal portion of the uh, eye from any kind of uh, thermal radiation. It turns out that index of refraction of uh, this part of the human eye is approximately 1.33, uh, which is exactly the index of refraction on the water. We already mentioned the lens, which is a focusing mechanism in the eye. So we are talking about the flexible tissue that changes shape in the conjunction cornea. The lens will be focusing light on the back of the eye, and it has this ability to change, changes, to change the shape. Uh, and if it's changing shape, the focal length of uh, of this lens is going to change, which would enable the eye to focus on both near and far objects. We also have iris that controls the amount of light that enters the eye. That's going to be the pigmented or colored part of the eye uh, that responds to the light intensity by adjusting its size. So if we are in a, in a light environment, the pupil, which is the dark spot at, at the center of the iris, is going to uh, uh, be it's going to uh, uh, reduce its uh, its size, and by doing that, naturally, is going to prevent huge amounts of light uh, from entering the eye. On the other side, if we are in a dark environment, the pupil is going to open or is going to uh, dilate, and it's going to enable uh, maximum of the light to enter to enter the eye. So as far as the pupil is concerned, again, we are talking about opening the center of the iris. Uh, the size of the pupil is changing from 2 to 7 millimeters. Uh, we are talking about the dilation of the, of the pupil. And uh, as already mentioned, darken the environment, the larger the pupil, fully dilated pupil uh, that's uh, uh, expanded to admit the greatest amount of light is about 7 millimeters. And uh, we also have a so-called vitreous humor that is uh, a colorless gel that fills the large area at the center of the eyeball uh, and uh, its main purpose is to help and uh, uh, maintain the shape of the eye. One of the most important parts of the human eye is so-called retina. Uh, retina is located in the back of the eye and it is a light sensitive layer that can be um, viewed as a, a small screen uh, onto which all the light is being uh, focused uh, through the cornea and the lens. Retina is directly uh, connected to the optical nerve uh, so all the, all the uh, uh, excitation from the light that's coming through the eye is going to be turned into the electrical pulses that are collected on the retina and further transferred uh, through, the, through the optical nerve. Uh, the retina contains two types of photoreceptors, uh, so-called rods and cones that are operating differently uh, in different uh, environments, either light or dark. Uh, it's also important to mention that signals that are transmitted to the uh, optical nerve, nerve uh, are going all the way uh, to the uh, brain and that's how we are developing the sense of, uh, of, uh, of vision. Um, we also have a fovea that represents the most sensitive central part of the retina uh, and that is the area that's responsible for the most, most detailed vision uh, that uh, uh, each uh, human being has. A, a foveal lesion caused by the laser radiation is a worst case scenario for, for vision and that's exactly why we have uh, the potential hazard when we are operating with the, with the uh, lasers, especially high power lasers. It's also important to mention that sensitivity of the human eye to the light is not the same for all the wavelengths. 
So for example, it turns out that uh, the ultraviolet range of light that ranges from 315 uh, to 280 nanometers or 280 to 100 nanometers, which is ultraviolet B, and finally ultraviolet C, are primarily uh, absorbed in the cornea, in the front portion of the eye. And for that reason, UV light uh, uh, in most cases is not as, as dangerous as other, other uh, wavelengths of uh, light. If we are looking at the range of 315 to 400 nanometers, which we are still in, a, uh, in an ultraviolet range, this, uh, these uh, wavelengths are going to be absorbed principally uh, in the lens of the eye, so they are also not uh, being uh, transferred to the lens uh, all the way to the back of the retina. The most hazardous is going to be the infrared radiation, especially uh, eye, uh, infrared A range. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, the infrared uh, radiation is uh, passing to both uh, cornea and lens and uh, finally reaches the retina which is in the back of the in, of the eye so the, the the whole absorption of this type of a uh, of a light radiation is in a, a retinal, pig, re, retinal pigment which is the dark brown layer with exceptionally large blood vessels and high blood fl uh, flow rate uh, which is, which represents the most sensitive part of the retina and that's that's the reason why these wavelengths are the most hazardous for the human eye and finally, we also want to mention uh, the uh, safety hazard uh, to a different uh, human organ, which is our skin. Uh, so there is a certain potential risk to the skin. Uh, however, these are considered secondary to, to the risks uh, to, the, uh, to the eyes. So skin injuries due to laser exposure may affect only the external dead layer of the skin cells. This uh, impact can be either thermal or uh, photochemical. In order to fully understand, the impact of the laser light to the skin. We also have to understand the anatomy of the skin. Uh, when we are talking about skin, we are talking about two main layers, so-called epidermis, which is the surface layer, and the dermis, which is underlying layer. So this uh, outer layer also has its uh, surface, that so-called stratum corneum, that consists mainly of the dead cells and gives protection against the water loss, abrasion, dust, air, and other environmental effects. Uh, if you're looking at a layer of epidermis that's just below the stratum corneum, uh, there we have specialized cells that produce the, uh, the melanin pigment uh, granules and that is responsible for the darkest of our skin. And uh, that type of uh, uh, melanin pigment is actually responsible for the protection of our skin against harmful uh, ultraviolet radiation. So uh, uh, these uh, uh, cells are uh, absorbing the radiation, they darken, and they are responsible for the skin color change uh, during the sun tanning. As we already mentioned, uh, the laser light can also uh, be a, a safety hazard for the skin. It turns out that the skin reflects most of the visible and infrared radiation, while uh, the absorption happens in an ultraviolet range. For that reason, especially for the, for, for the uh, ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B uh, range, the, uh, the skin is very sensitive, uh, so there, uh, these types of uh, radiations can be harmful, harmful from, the, you know, from the perspective of, uh, of, the, of their absorption in a, in a human skin. So with enough power and duration, the incident radiation of any wavelength uh, in turn can uh, penetrate the protective uh, filters and layers of the epidermis and uh, cause deep internal injuries. So uh, again, important to mention that ultraviolet is the most critical but does not, we don't want to restrict uh, uh, potential uh, hazards to the ultraviolet only because other wavelengths can also pose a safety risk if, the, if, uh, if, the, if they reach certain powers and certain uh, uh, durations or, or of exposure. Uh, Laser-induced thermal change to the skin is most pronounced in a far infrared wavelengths such as uh, those produced by uh, CO2 lasers, so certain types of lasers are also a safety risk for our skin in addition to the uh, safety hazards to our eyes. With this we are going to conclude our lecture number seven. So in this lecture we elaborated on uh, light sources. We uh, mentioned at the beginning of this uh, course that uh, photonics deals with uh, all aspects of the light. 
uh, including the light production. So we are going to need light sources in our photonics labs, in our photonics experiments, because in order to uh, create the optical system and uh, in, in order to manipulate with the light and uh, put it to a uh, proper use, we need to first produce the light and for that purpose we are going to be using the light sources that are uh, elaborated to a certain extent in this lecture. So we covered non-laser man-made types of uh, light sources. We are going, going to be uh, talking about other light sources, especially uh, uh, laser types uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the lectures that, in lectures that follow in different courses. And then finally in this lecture we also uh, elaborated on, an, on the anatomy of the human eye and the skin from the perspective of the safety hazards that uh, exist in uh, photonics labs when we are, when we are um, uh, op operating with the, the different types of uh, light sources. So next time in lecture number eight, now that we know about the anatomy of the human eye and the skin, we are going to talk about uh, important aspects of the laser safety and you know how it is to be implemented in the photonics lab so that everyone is safe and uh, no, uh, no uh, risk to, uh, to the safety of our uh, eyes and our skin is, uh, uh, is increased or present in, uh, in the lab. With this, uh, we are going to conclude the lecture number seven here, and uh, I wish you the nice rest of the day, and I'll see you next time in lecture eight.